Hey, good morning, City Life family. Welcome to church. Glad you guys joined in with us. Um, we are continuing in our online ministry, but we do want to encourage you. Actually, on Sundays, we are now meeting live. Our COVID restrictions have lessened, and we are able to meet together. Currently, we're generally meeting in the park, uh, presidential park, right next to the church on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. So if you do have the ability to come meet out in person, we do encourage you to do so, okay? You know, um, really in this time of COVID, we've been scattered like stones and it's this time of gathering back together. And I know sometimes it's we're going to be a little bit slower to gather back, but it is good to be in fellowship. We are built we are created to be in fellowship, fellowship with God the Father and fellowship with one another. So I do encourage you, if you have an opportunity, come on out Sundays, 10 a.m. If not, log in here and uh, we'll just have this wonderful moment together online. Um, we hope that you are blessed, that you're encouraged, that you have something to take into your spirit to feed yourself uh, and to go fight the good fight and to go strong in Jesus. So be blessed, be a blessing, enjoy the service.
All right, guys, we're just going to bring a short word of encouragement to you. Uh, we have been going through the life of Jesus, and we're going to look primarily at Luke chapter 7, and also a little bit from Matthew's kind of parallel stories. But um, the topic of this, today's sermon is the God that we need, the God that we need. And I believe that all of us, you, me, everyone in our city, everyone in this world is a theologian, okay? And now you may not think of yourself a theologian, but we're all theologians in the sense that we all have theologies. We all have ideas about who God is, what He can do, what He can't do, what He's willing to do, uh, His characteristics, how He feels towards us or doesn't feel towards us. Even if you're an atheist, you have a theology about God. You just simply believe He doesn't exist and He can do nothing, right? And if you are a Christian, hopefully you believe in the things that are describing God in, that are in the Bible, right? Those things, those foundational things, these love letters to us so that we might know who God is. But unfortunately, many times we have theologies, we have ideas about God that are wrong, right? They're ideas that we have created in our hearts, in our minds. They're sometimes just projections of our own um, desires or hurts and struggles. And we've kind of put a lot of things on God that God is not, right? And and so today we're going to talk about, you know, the God that we need, the God that we get, the God who is real versus the God who we've created ideas about, right? And we're going to share a story. It's going to be kind of shared backwards. So I'm going to do the front end last and the last end first. Um, kind of biblical, right? The first will be last and last will be first. A very Jesus thing. Um, but anyways, there's these two stories that are a window into the life and the ministry of Jesus. And... They, two groups of people who have a radically different experience, mostly based on their ideas, but also their pains, okay? So let's look at it. It's, um, uh, it's going to be in Luke chapter 7 primarily, but I'm going to be pulling some verses from Matthew 11, which are parallel passage to this. And the context of the story is simply that Jesus has gone out and he has done some miracles in Capernaum and now he's going out into the countryside of Galilee around the large lake and he is preaching in towns and healing people and his disciples are doing the same and the word is getting out about Jesus. And this first picture that we have, it's in Luke chapter 7, verse 24 through 35. And it's this group of people who have a pet theology, okay? And what I mean by pet theology is they've got a, an idea about God that they are grooming and they are feeding and that they are supporting. And they're holding on to it dearly, just like you would a little puppy or a little kitten, you know, it's, or a little baby, you know. It's just, it is something that is, you have affections for, right? Um, and these ideas are leading them to not understand who Jesus is. And so I'm just going to, uh, and so anyways, there's these doubts about who Jesus is. And he comes on the scene there questioning, is he who he says he is? And it even gets to the point where John the Baptist, who was a close ally with Jesus, he is currently in jail and he hears about Jesus and he sends some disciples of his to ask Jesus, are you the one that we were expecting or should we wait for somebody else? Even his close allies, Jesus' close friends, his family members, uh, those who declared him clearly, some of them were doubting, right? And they were doubting because Jesus didn't always match up to their theologies, their expectations. Now, in Jesus' day, and even our day, there's a lot of ideas about who is the Messiah. You go to Israel today, and there's lots of disagreements about what the Messiah is to be, who is God, you know? And in Jesus' day, they pretty much revolved around a few things. One is that they thought that he would be a king, and he would be a king who would overthrow the Roman government. Uh, others thought he would be kind of like a similar idea, but kind of a revolutionary. Uh, some thought he would be this kind of great spiritual leader that would get people back to observing the law and following the rituals. Uh, and anyways, Jesus didn't quite match anyone's expectations. And so they're questioning him and they're doubting him. And even, as I said before, John the Baptist, uh, his close friend, is also doubting him. And they were hung up on their expectations. 
Now Jesus describes this group and he has this saying, says, uh, who can I compare this generation to? It's in verse uh, Matthew 11, verse 16 and 17. It says, who can I, how can I compare this generation? What can I use as an example? And then he says, they're like children in the marketplaces. And if you've been to big marketplaces where there's families selling vegetables and flowers and things like this, think of kind of like Militi Chova, or if you've been to different places, maybe in India or uh, the Middle East, you know, these souks, these outdoor markets. You know, you've got the families working and then you've got these kids who are there and they're bored and so they're kind of coming up with games. And he talks about one of these games and it's the kids are sitting in the marketplace and they're calling out to each other, you know, hey, we played the pipe for you. We played a happy song and you didn't dance. And we sang a dirge. We sang a sad song and you did not mourn. Basically, it was kind of like a dance contest. You know, we did this kind of rhythm and you didn't really cooperate. You didn't dance along with the song we were singing. And Jesus uses this picture, says, you know, this is what the generation is like. This is what you guys are like, is you guys are like children who are calling in the marketplace. You've got your ideas about something. You've got your rhythms. You've got your songs. You've got your beats. And God's not dancing to your tune. And you're complaining, right? And that's what was going on in his day. And sometimes that can go on in our day, right? Where God doesn't conform to what we want him to conform to. He's not like what we are expecting, right? And so we don't want to accept him. And Jesus will say, you know, uh, blessed are those who do not stumble, who do not um, get offended because of who I am, who I really am. And um, and there's that reality that many of us will, many maybe not us, hopefully not us, but many people in our world will stumble and fall over who Jesus really is because he doesn't conform to who they would like him to be. Um, but he says there, blessed, favored by God, are those of you who accept him as he is. Those of you who embrace Jesus as he is. I want to shift to this other group of people. So this was the kind of the negative group of people. Now we're going to look to a positive group of people. And this people, this group of people have, probably they have their theologies about Messiah. We are not really told. What they have that is overshadowing any of their theologies is their pain, okay? Now this is a group of people who are experiencing a death in the family, and I don't know if you've experienced a death in the family, but when you've got a death and with close people to you, you know, you begin to think about the things of life, and the things that are not important fall away, and the things that are important just kind of get honed in with laser point precision, right? Um, and there's this family who has lost their son and he is in he's the only son of a widow and Jesus is coming into this little town of Nain and we see it in Luke chapter 7 verse 11 and he's with his disciples and as they're coming into the town there's this funeral procession and there's this body of this young man being carried by some other young men maybe his friends um, and his mother is weeping and everyone is crying and Jesus comes up and he says do not cry and it says literally in verse 13 it says the Lord Jesus he saw this widow he saw this mother he saw her pain and his heart went out to her his heart was moved for her and says do not cry right and then he reaches up and he touches this young man who's dead his body and says young man I say to you get up get up and it says he instantly gets up and he begins to speak right and Jesus gives him back to his mother and it says this crowd goes wild you know they break out into worship and praise and they said there has been a prophet who has come to us and in fact they say God has actually come and to our need he has come in the flesh for us now I don't know if this was their idea about God but this is the God that they needed right and this is the God Jesus is right he is this God who has lots of characteristics but one of the characteristics that he has over and over and over again is he is the God of compassion compassion and this word comes up many many times in the Bible related to the person the character the attribute of who God is 
who he really is. You know, he is a God of compassion, right? And compassion is an interesting word because it means to co-passion, to share passion with someone else, to share pains with someone else, to share experiences with someone else. It is really a very Emmanuel word, a very God with us kind of word, right? It is this characteristic of being moved to action when you see something happen, when you see someone else's need and you identify with that need. And that is the kind of God that we serve. That is the kind of God that we relate to. He's a God of compassion. And we see here in this little story that Jesus is moved with compassion for this widow, for this family, for this community. And we see later, actually, it's, it's a beautiful picture in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, is in heaven. God is, you know, He's the same today, tomorrow, and forevermore. It says in heaven there's going to be a day where He's going to wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death. And there will be no more mourning. And be no more crying. And be no more pain. And the old order ways, the old ways of doing things, life, death, pain, all these things are going to be swept away in the presence of our compassionate God. And, you know, there's so many ways we could describe God, but I think this is just one of those beautiful ways that He is ready to move towards those He loves and comfort those He loves. Now, I want to just, I, hopefully you're already, you know, I don't think I need to convince you, but let me go through some other verses, you know, where Jesus shows this characteristic of compassion. Other points where he was moved, where he saw things and he couldn't stand still. He had to do something on behalf. Um, we see that there's a group of people and they, huge group of people, a crowd. And in Matthew chapter 9 verse 36 says, He saw this crowd and he was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He saw people who were lost, who needed guidance, and he could not stand to sit still. He had to go do something. He had to go comfort them and teach them and guide them in the life. We see in Matthew 14, 14 that he is moved for the sick. He has compassion on the sick and he cannot stop and he cannot do nothing, but he must heal them. In Matthew 15, 32, he sees there's this huge crowd of people who've been with him for a few days and he's moved to feed them because they're hungry. He says, they must be filled and he fills their stomachs. Um, he sees blind people and he'll be moved to compassion to help the blind. We see that in uh, Matthew 20, 34. Um, there's also lepers, these people who were outcasts. And again, many times Jesus is moved to compassion. He sees them and he must do something for them. Um, and, you know, these are some, just a few of the many, many examples of Jesus being this God of compassion. We also have some wonderful parables. You know, there's this parable of there's this debtor, this servant who has this life, you know, this debt that would take, he couldn't even accomplish to pay back in his whole life. And the king says, you know, it's okay. And that was an example of Jesus where this king was moved with compassion for his servant. And he said, you know, I clear the debt. We have another picture of the prodigal son, right? You know this wonderful story where there's this son who walks away from the family, takes his inheritance, squanders it on everything, and then he's down and out on his luck, right? And he thinks, hey, I could come back. I could be a servant of my father. And the beautiful part in the story is that he's coming back wanting to beg mercy from his father. And it says his father's waiting there. And when his father sees his son, he's moved with compassion. That same phrase, that same word, he's driven because of his love for his son to run to him and to restore him and bring him back into the family. And not as a servant, but as a son, as a cherished, honored son. And so these are the, uh, the pictures that Jesus paints of himself the encounters, the actions that he does that tell us that this is the kind of God that we serve. We serve a God of compassion. Now, maybe you're hearing all these things and you're like, yeah, I, I get it in my head, but in my heart, I'm just not there right now, you know? And maybe you're a lot like John the Baptist. You know, John the Baptist, he was a believer. He believed in Jesus, but he's in this situation. He's in jail, right? He's in a tough 
time, uh, uh, uncomfortable circumstances. And in that circumstance, in that uncomfortability, he begins to doubt. He begins to question, is Jesus who I really thought he was, right? And when John sent those disciples to kind of double check just to make sure, Jesus, are you really the one? Um, Jesus answers them, and we didn't read the answer, so I'm going to read it for you now. Um, you can see it in Matthew chapter um, 11, verse 4. Jesus tells John's disciples, go back and report this to John. You know, tell him what you've heard and what you've seen, what you've experienced right now. He says, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who had leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news, the good news being that Jesus Messiah has come in flesh and blood, Emmanuel, God with us, is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. And so that was Jesus' answer, you know. It says, you know, report back to John what you've experienced, what you've heard. And what did they experience in here? They experienced the presence and the power of God right there and then, right? He says, report that back. Report that back to John. And maybe that's kind of what we need, you know, if we're in those moments of doubt. Just ask the Lord, you know. Show your presence to me. Show your good news to me. Show your power to me. Remind me of who you are. I need a touch from you. And he will do that. He will do that. Um, I love how the end of uh, that miracle of the, the widow's son being raised ends, you know, where the people break out into worship. They've experienced the gospel. They've experienced the power and the presence of God. And they say, God has shown up and helped us today. God has shown up and helped us today. And let us be a people who invite God to show up, show up and help us today. And so I just want to leave you with a little call of action. One last verse. It's from uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. It says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, you're God's chosen people, remember that, okay? You're holy and you're dearly loved. That is how Jesus describes you. You're chosen, you're holy, you're deeply and dearly loved. He says, if you are those things and you are those things, he says, clothe yourself with compassion. Wrap yourself up in the compassion of Jesus. That is, should be our garment. That should be what we envelop ourselves in, in the love and the comfort and the compassion of Jesus Christ. And he goes on, he'll say, Wrap yourselves, clothe yourselves in compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. All those things are just kind of the outpouring, the result of experiencing the compassion of Jesus. So I encourage you this week, you know, throw away those pet theologies that are wrong and just embrace the God of compassion. Embrace Jesus. And if you have those doubts, invite his gospel, invite his good news of his power and his presence into your heart, into your life, into your situations, your circumstances again and again and again. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to leave some verses in the, uh, comment, uh, in the comment section or the description here. And uh, these verses are kind of like our wardrobe of the kind of what we can wrap ourselves in, the comfort of Jesus. So there's tons of verses about the comfort of God, and I just want to put some of them there. Uh, do some homework this week. Read through those things. Meditate on those things. Wrap yourself in the comfort of Jesus this week. Be blessed and be a blessing. Take care, guys.
for all Once and for all All right, guys, great service. Hope you guys were blessed. Hope you guys were enjoying it. Hope you guys took something to nourish your spirits so you can move on forward into the things of Jesus. Um, please do, if you haven't signed up, uh, haven't subscribed to this YouTube channel, please do. That way you can automatically get the services. And again, we do encourage you, if you got an opportunity, Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, we are meeting live in the park, if it's rainy weather, in the building. Um, every Sunday. So please do join. Um, hope to see you in person. God bless you.